welcome. I'm Christine Hasdorf, the current director of the Archaeological Research Facility, and so we're here tonight to uh, talk about um, fire and what it, uh, its impact on the world and, and people's engagement with that. So welcome to this Archaeological Research Facility event called the Fire Panel, and thank you for coming. I know it's a busy, busy week. Just a little bit about the uh, archaeological research facility. Many of you know about it, but we just wanted to say that it's the home of archaeological research uh, at UC Berkeley, and it brings together more than 40 faculty affiliates from across one dozen academic departments. Sorry, should I keep that going? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> each year we provide uh, enabling uh, funding for uh, more than two dozen archaeological field and laboratory projects that are carried out by our affiliates and graduate students that occur around the world, including California. And we are in, delighted to share the um, research free to the public through a series of presentations, this one included, but also every Wednesday at noon in the Archaeological Research Facility building, which is that little teeny brick building next to the law school called 2251 College Building, which is impossible to remember. And uh, we also have a website, and all, uh, current research is, pub is presented there. And also, our, uh, all of our publications, our monograph series and reports are now free and open access online, so you can go and get many archaeological reports, that especially linked to California, uh, there as well. We are building up our public programs, and we invite you to participate. If you have any ideas and you want to get involved, you can join our mailing list make a donation to Berkeley, volunteer at a lab, or just make suggestions. Um, we hope that you will um, enjoy the panelists tonight, and we want to thank them all uh, for coming uh, from far and near and sharing their work, their, uh, some long-lived work, some dangerous work with us together. And uh, to now I'd like to turn over the, um, uh, the panel tonight to the moderator, John Holson, who is here from a, a local um, company, I guess company, uh, pa Pacific, Pacific Legacy. I was trying to think of what, what it was, an institution as well. Anyway, and he is going to moderate the fire panel for us tonight. So thank you very much, John, and welcome. Good evening. <laughs> My name is Michael Krasny, and welcome to the forum. Whoops, <laughs> wrong program. First of all, we want to thank you all for coming out tonight for this discussion on fire, a topic that is central to our everyday lives. I'm John Holson, institutionalized at Pacific Legacy Incorporated, and I'm going to be your moderator for tonight, which means I have to keep these four speakers under control as best I can. As a cultural resources consultant, my experience with one more detaching. We complete surveys, write management plans, work with agencies such as FEMA, the U.S. Forest Service, and NPS during reconstruction after wildfire. Part of that is assessing damage to cultural resources due to fire and fire suppression activity. One of our current projects is in Northern California to have this treatment of the car fire. But enough about me. Tonight's talk is the first in a series of lectures given and supported by the Archaeological Research Facility, also known as ARF. ARF. That's ARF. At the University of California, Berkeley, over the coming months. The series is a public outreach effort where the goal is to inform you, the community, on the types of research being conducted by ARF and its affiliate scholars in archaeology and relevancy to our everyday lives. Tonight's forum, Humans and Fire in the Past, Present, and Future Archaeological Perspectives, brings together four perspectives on how fire has been identified and managed by humans in various landscapes. The topics for tonight include the early hominid beginnings of the use of fire, ceremony, cer did I hear a phone go off? Ah, it was mine? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Ceremonial burning practices in the Neolithic in Southeast Europe, the Native American use of fire as a landscape management strategy, and the challenges the U.S. forest archaeologists currently address while fighting modern fires. Earth, air, fire, and water are considered ancient elements found to be central to the essence of life in many cultures. 
As Stephen Pine, a fire specialist from the University of Arizona writes, fire is the odd one out. Earth, water, and air are substances, while fire is a reaction. It takes its character from its context. The chemistry of fire is biochemistry. The fire takes apart what photosynthesis creates. Fire evokes many feelings for us, most of which is contextual. It's the circumstances of the fire that makes and brings back memories. Most of us have memories of fire bringing warmth and comfort within a context of social interactions, perhaps revolving around fire, such as food preparation, cooking, or putting s'mores together over the outdoor campfire. In these contexts, fire is benign, helpful, and comforting. On a larger scale, fire is integral in the development of agriculture and food production through clearing, field burning, and returning nutrients to the ground for successive cropping. However, fire is difficult to control. In many cultures, view it as a force that demands respect, and in many cases, fear. This is so true in the current fire hazard conditions we Californians experience with our ever more frequent and intense wildfires. Indeed, they are happening worldwide. Fires can bring fear, sorrow, and destruction. As we have seen not only in the prehistoric times, but historically, fire can wipe out settlements in a short period of time and radically reshape the landscape with respect to plant communities and human colonization. Fire has been linked to the idea of rejuvenation, as we shall see in some, one of our talks tonight. Indeed, in Greek mythology, the phoenix came back to life after burning. The phoenix rising from the ashes is a sign of perseverance, renewal, and regeneration. Tonight, we will consider the long relationship between people and fire, and the relationship that is complex and mutable. Our panelists will discuss the diverse and changing impacts of fire on human populations and, peop and how people have manipulated fire for power and for survival. The panel will highlight how our archaeological heritage around the world can help us learn to better confront the new challenges we face as a community threatened by fire today. So our panelists include Dr. Tim Gill, an ARF affiliate and scholar who will discuss early prehistoric control and use of fire and how fire may have played a key role in human evolution. Our second topic tonight will be uh, second speaker. She's also a topic too, but anyway, is uh, Professor Ruth Trigham, uh, whose research in prehistoric Southeast Europe shows how fires were intentionally set in houses to perhaps mark the end of a household cycle. Dr. Ken Lightfoot will discuss his work on California Native American Indian fire practices in California and what we can learn from them. And our last speaker, Lynn Gassaway, is a fire archaeologist with the U.S. Forest Service who will talk about her how her team deals with the impacts of fire on archaeological and cultural resources. Uh, by the way, Lynn did her undergrad she would work here at Berkeley in anthropology. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Tim, who will be our first guest speaker tonight. And hopefully we'll have some time for questions from the audience afterwards. I kind of come with my own microphone, so if you guys can hear in the back, I'll maybe... Oh, I got a few thumbs up. I'll just <laughs> stand out here. Now, I've been given the job of talking about the last uh, one and a half million years, and I've been given 10 minutes to do it. So by my calculation, that's 2,500 years every second. So if I move along pretty quickly, I hope you can tolerate that. What I'd like to do is talk about a few of the highlights, uh, some of the questions that people like to ask, like when was fire discovered, and we'll actually ask whether that's even the right question. Uh, and some theories about how fire fit into human evolution, and then some of the neat things that people and pre-people, if you would, pre-humans, did with fire. So maybe I'll get going on that. Uh, let's see. Does this work? We'll just start here. So just a few words about human evolution, less than you ever need to know, but hopefully enough for today. So this is, a, this is one of these charts you see a lot of, and time moves from, I don't think this one's on. This, this moves, uh, time moves from the left to the right, and you can see the bars represent different types of, uh, different types of humans and then pre-humans. And I just wanted to introduce, um, okay, the magic device, here we go introduce a couple of our players tonight. You can see the Australopithecines are off to the left, and then you move into our genus Homo, 
as you move over toward the right. And a few that, a couple that we'll be talking about are Homo, Homo neanderthalensis, which is a debatable term, but basically the Neanderthals, and also Homo erectus, uh, which was the first hominid really to move out of Africa and spread around the world. So I just wanted to point that out. Here's Darwin's very, very elegant phrase, descent with modification. And one thing just to bear in mind is that the way we live now with just one type of human on the planet is actually unusual. Until 40,000 years ago, there were multiple types of humans around. And I don't mean, it's, it's really much different than what we're used to today because today everyone's part of one species. In those days, not necessarily so. So that's a big difference as we move forward. Here's just a, a drawing, interestingly, has fire in it, uh, and probably misleadingly so because of where this is supposed to have taken place, but it gives you an idea of Homo erectus and perhaps some of the living conditions that uh, might have been around when Homo erectus was on the planet. Now, my absolute favorite, the Neanderthals, they're worth a few words as well. The classic view of Neanderthals, very primitive, little scared, always hunched over, definitely nothing to laugh about, perhaps a little bit confused by the situation. That's how Neanderthals are. And, and you even hear the word used in common discourse from time to time when somebody, uh, you read it sometimes in the political articles that uh, so-and-so's a Neanderthal. Well, in the political context, that's probably an insult to the Neanderthals, but um, <laughs> anyway, the view, has, the view of this has changed somewhat. So nowadays, Neanderthals are part of the family. <laughs> we learned about 10 years ago, actually through the DNA analysis, that uh, most of us, not everyone, if, you have, uh, if you're entirely of African descent, if that's where your ancestors came from, you probably don't have any Neanderthal genes. Anyone else uh, probably does, a few percent in there. So there was some interbreeding at some point in the past. Now, the topic everybody <laughs> likes to ask is, when was fire discovered? And I think it's really the wrong question to ask because most likely fire discovered humans, not the other way around, if you're gonna use the word discover. What we're really interested in was when did humans or pre-humans begin to control fire? When could they make it and use it intentionally and not just be subjected to it? And so let's talk about that. It turns out it's not actually a very simple question to answer. Uh, it, it would be easy to think that at some point in prehistory, this discovery was made and it spread around the world. But we're really talking about a world where there were small groups of mobile hunter-gatherers moving around the landscape. So even when it was discovered at one point on one continent, it's quite likely that the knowledge was lost and had to be rediscovered elsewhere. It would have been a lot easier today if someone would have discovered fire and posted it on Facebook. Uh, hey, I'm down here in what's going to be Tanzania a million years from now, and I just discovered fire. You know, hashtag burn thumb or something. <laughs> so, uh, but it wasn't like that. So, um, one, of the, one of the reasons that it's difficult to say really clearly when fire was discovered, aside from what I just said, is there's certain problems. So we look for certain things in the archaeological record that might indicate that fire was at a site. When you're digging down in the dirt, what do you look for? And these are some of the things. But they're problems. First of all, fire exists naturally. And finding ashes in an archaeological site doesn't mean that humans created fire there. And you can see lightning strikes, or we see that here in the Sierra as well. Volcanic eruptions, when those ha took place, could also have started fires. So finding fire doesn't mean you found human uh, control. And then there's the additional layer of problems that there are a number of natural processes that also create what looks like fire in the archeological record. So one thing just to note before we go any further is just because you find materials that had been subjected to heat, you find them in your, your site, in the unit you're digging, and you also find cultural artifacts, doesn't necessarily mean that the people started that fire and could control it washing through a whole lot of debate. This is kind of what we end up with. Uh, there's a cave in South Africa that could be the oldest confirmed one in about a million years where it really does look as though humans repeatedly made fires in that site. Uh, but by the time you get to about 400,000 years ago, I know these numbers are beyond comprehension, uh, but by the time you get to 400,000 years ago and up toward the present, 
it does appear in a number of sites that uh, there was um, extensive use of fire, which would imply control of fire. So a few notes about that. Interestingly, there are a lot of sites where there is no evidence of fire. So as Homo erectus and later the Neanderthals and some of our ancestors moved into the northern latitudes, you would think you'd want to have some fire or would need fire perhaps to move into those areas. But there are a lot of sites that don't have it. So that's, that's uh, something to think about. Um, and I already talked about this one, that control of fire could have been achieved many times in many different places. So that's just a few notes on when was fire discovered. Now, one of the, the big theories having to do with fire and human control of it is what's called the cooking hypothesis. And this is an idea that control of fire actually began with Homo erectus. So here we're already getting into some questionable terrain. And the use of fire actually created a, or changed us biologically to the point where we are obligated to use fire. We had, we had obligated to use fire to cook our food. Uh, and that, according to the theory, gave rise to a lot of uh, evolutionary changes in the jaw and tooth structure, also in the digestive system. Um, and it was this better nutrition that really allowed people to do the kinds of things to increase brain size. It takes a lot of energy to support a brain, at least for some of us, maybe not mine, <laughs> but uh, for a lot of people it takes a lot of energy. And it also allows a lot of more mobility as well. Critiques of the cooking hypothesis, as already mentioned, not entirely clear that Homo erectus, probably Homo erectus could control fire in some places, but was it widespread enough that it would have that big evolutionary change? Hard to say. Um, as I mentioned, there are a lot of sites where there is no evidence of fire, and even some Neanderthal sites in cold climates, and this was a, a much colder time overall when the Neanderthals were living in Europe and Western Asia than we have today. Not entirely, there were ups and downs, there were fluctuations in the climate, but there were a lot of very cold periods and you would think you would need fire, but strangely we don't always find it. This you can read for yourself. Still some research to do on exactly what the effects of cooking food would be. And um, the digestive system evolution is perhaps more complicated than what the, the theory might suggest is more of a straight line. So how many people have been into caves and Professor Conkey can't raise her hand. <laughs> You've been in more than 5,000, doesn't count. So what's it like in there when you get away from the opening of the cave? It's dark. It's, it's pretty dark. There is actually an image in there lit up by, uh, I think, a cell phone light. And this, I, I took this picture in a, a cave in France where the Volpe River flows into a mountain, and we went exploring in there one day. It's pretty dark. So one of the obvious uses of fire in prehistory is to provide illumination. Now when I put these pictures up here because one thing that's very noticeable in a cave is whatever's outside the range of whatever lighting device you have, it's still totally dark. So these are modern floodlights here and you can see in the back that where the floodlight doesn't hit, you can't see anything. And what people used in those days was, was more rudimentary, I would say, than the uh, floodlights we have. This is a, um, a lamp from Lascaux Cave in France. And a lot of these were found in that cave and in other locations. So this is turned on its side. If you turn it flat in that little hollowed out area, you could put some animal fat, perhaps with a, a wick of juniper, and you could get some light, a flickering light, actually, uh, but some light that would last for a period of time. Other ways of getting into caves would, or light that would get you into caves would be torches and then hearths, which is uh, a word for a fireplace, basically. If you build a fire in there, obviously, you can get some light that way. Um, so, just some, I wanted to go over a few interesting things, I think, that Neanderthals and early modern humans did with fire. First of all, this came out a year or two ago, a cave in southwest France. This is 300 meters deep inside a cave. So if you can imagine more than three football fields inside a cave. Obviously, it's totally dark in there. It's probably pretty cold, uh, although caves do tend to keep a regular temperature, cool but regular. And you can see a number of these circular structures were found made mostly of stalagmites. Uh, and there are some parts inside here that were identified as well. So this was a time period when modern humans had not yet gotten to Europe. So it would have been Neanderthals who created this. And obviously fire was required 
both to explore the cave and to stay in there for a while. This is pretty obvious, but it's worth mentioning. Without um, fire or other means of light that are types of fire, it would be very difficult to um, come up with some of the great imagery that we see. And who could resist but to throw a picture of Chauvet up there with a panel with the horses. And we've got some, oops, we've got some uh, fighting rhinos here and some aurochs on the far side. So some fantastic art, if we can call it that, a very loaded term, but some fantastic imagery made possible by um, fire. Here's a neat trick. So um, boxwood, I guess, is an extremely hard wood. So it's very good for making implements out of, but it's very hard to shape with a stone tool. You're going to be resharpening your, your blade quite often. Apparently, the Neanderthals, though, figured out that if they heated it, if they charred the boxwood, it was much easier to scrape the edges off, to shape the top. So you can see here that uh, the top has a very rounded edge, much easier. If, these are thought to be digging sticks, so it's nice to have a rounded edge, like you'd have on a screwdriver, right? The back of a screwdriver is often very rounded, so you can put more pressure on it without hurting your hand. And to have one of these makes a guy really happy. It might be the only picture of prehistory with somebody happy. The pictures in prehistory, it's always so miserable, you know? Um, anyway, this guy's happy because he's got that boxwood stick. This is also interesting. So uh, hafting is a word that archaeologists use and other people use to talk about fixing a point on a stick or on a handle of some kind. And there are different ways to haft. For example, if you want to make a spear, it's good to have a nice sharp spear point that will actually go into an animal and cause some damage. Uh, it's also nice not to have to do it by hand because if you're hunting large animals like bison and deer and other animals to get up close and personal, very dangerous. In fact, uh, there was a study a few decades ago comparing the injuries that were found on Neanderthal skeletons with those of rodeo riders today. And they came out fairly similar. So these were people, the Neanderthals, who were up close and personal hunting big game. So it's, in that situation, it's really nice to have your, your point on the end of a spear. Either you can throw it, or at least you can stay a few feet away. So the Neanderthals figured out that they could actually extract, using fire, extract birch tar and use that to glue spear points to the end of uh, shafts. Kind of amazing, actually. So I don't think it's that easy to do. I mean, if we tried to do it, people have tried. Another little trick here in Southern Africa. This, now, these are modern humans at this time period in Southern Africa. Figured out that if they heated the rocks before they tried to nap them into stone tools, that was also very effective. And then finally, just one more example here. Maybe the most interesting one in a way, because it's not as utilitarian as the other ones I've been talking about. So this is a site in, uh, I think I wrote Czech Republic, but I think it's actually Slovakia. Anyway, it's out in that part of the world, 26,000 years ago. And some kilns were uncovered during the excavations. And a lot of, I'm not sure I want to call them ceramics, but clay pieces that had been exploded through thermal shock by taking a somewhat moist piece of clay and putting it in a really hot fire inside the kiln and exploding it. And virtually all the pieces of clay were exploded in this fashion. So the, the question becomes, were these people just really bad at working clay? Now, this is long before pottery. Were they just really bad at it? Uh, did they maybe take all the good ones away? Or perhaps was the point of the whole exercise the explosion as opposed to the final product? We're so used to think of clay pieces and pottery that, oh, you know, we're looking for the final product. But it could be that the performance or the enactment of doing it was actually the key thing. So this is actually a pretty interesting um, topic. And I'll close just with this thought. Fire creates great potential for social life, especially in small groups of hunter-gatherers spread around the landscape. And here's an illustration uh, that Gilles, Gilles Tosello drew. And you can see a, a group of people and somebody <coughs> performing and an entire shadow up on the wall. Uh, it's supposed to be down near the Chauvet Cave. Uh, but it, I think it, it really raises the idea of what fire can be used for in a social setting. And there are a number of things. So first of all, it extends the time that you can be out. If you're a hunter-gatherer and it's all dark out there, that's a dangerous time to go wandering around. 
it's a dangerous time to be anywhere except kind of more in a defensive position. Now, once you have fire, it extends the time that people can be together. There is some research that's been done to the effect that the things that are talked about at night are different from what you talk about during the day. During the day, you might talk about all the things you have to do, where, how the hunting is going, where you might find some food sources. And at night, and maybe we've seen this from sitting around campfires. Campfires are a great time to uh, sit around, as someone I know said, sit around and tell lies. Or as we say in Hawaii, sit around and talk story. It's the perfect time for that. And you can really uh, mesh a a group together by telling stories, passing on group history, that sort of thing. It's also a great venue for music. So I thought the last thing I would say about fire is maybe there's a link between fire and music because this is a great time to sit around and play the flutes. And we do have flutes from pretty deep in prehistory. These are modern humans. This particular one is made from the radius of a uh, griffin vulture, but others are made from uh, uh, mammoth ivory, very difficult process to uh, reenact, and we have them from 35,000 years ago. So this cave is in southwest Germany, south of Stuttgart, and there's another cave about a mile away called Geisenklerstor, say that ten times real fast, and it had also three or four flutes have been recovered from that cave. So anyway, that's a quick <coughs> overview of fire and prehistory. I hope that was somewhat interesting. Lots of different uses that uh, people had for fire. So, thanks. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> I'm feeling it. <laughs> so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ruth Trickham, and her topic is burning houses <clears throat> in Neolithic Europe. So with these chairs here, Ruth, if you're starting to go over time, if I move, that oh, means you have four minutes, three minutes, again. two minutes. You didn't do it with Tim. You're not going to do it with me. Uh, you have to kind of cross the moderator around here. OK, so I think by now, uh, many of us are familiar. We're all familiar in California with the terrible mess that can be created by um, by burned houses on the landscape. I'm going to be talking about a similar terrible mess that was created by burned houses consistently in Southeast Europe about uh, 6,000 years ago or more, slightly more perhaps. So these, over a thousand year period of getting on for 1,500, I'll be, you know, we can be very flexible with our years at this time. He, uh, Tim could be even more flexible, but um, by the time we get into the Neolithic, this thousand year period you can see um, would be, so this is the kind of thing that we're talking about with this mass of burned clay rubble caused by burning houses and farmers, they're very close, you can see how close to the surface this is and the farmers hate it, they can't, they're Plants can't go through the burned rubble, which is a, a complete sort of almost like ceramic layer on the land. But archaeologists love it. Then uh, farmers hate it and archaeologists love it. So sometimes this we see settlements like the one here, which is about a thousand, lasted for about a thousand years. It's in Bulgaria. and. You can see these layers of the burned rubble in this one layer on top of another. That's pretty unusual, relatively unusual in the parts where I was e excavating in Southeast Europe, where there's um, one house is, is replaced by another one next to it rather than on top of it. But even so, the, the whole landscape of Southeast Europe in this, in this time period was has been covered by these, by these uh, burnt layers of burned rubble. It, up close, it looks like this. You can see the impressions of the wood frame of the, of the building um, impressed and frozen by the fire into the clay. The wood itself actually burns, is burned away and you never find that. So this is in an area across 
this huge area of Southeast Europe, this is Greece, um, all of Macedonia, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, all the way up into the Ukraine. It's an extraordinary phenomenon, what we call the burnt house horizon, and lasts from about 5,000 to 3,500 BC. You might think that, in fact, they had suffered back then from the same rash of catastrophic wildfires that we are experiencing in California. But interestingly enough, this interpretation has never been suggested amongst the rich array of explanations for the burnt house horizon. So for many years, archaeologists loved to excavate these and they would clear off all of the rubble of the walls in order to get to the floors of the houses where they would find a, larger, a rich array of uh, fragmented ceramics you can see here, other kinds of clay phenomena, an oven and clay balls, very, very rich um, inventory of materials that are found on the floor of the houses. Meanwhile, they uh, completely ignored the walls that are all collapsed inwards and lie on top of the floors, of the burned floors, and um, they generally threw all of that rubble from the walls and superstructure onto uh, dumps of some kind, and the farmers would, would take them off and use them to patch up muddy, muddy roads or wherever you needed something a bit more solid on the ground. The main interpretation traditionally for these burnt houses has been um, that they were accidental. That was one of the favorite explanations. Um, an accidental fire caused by houses or village wide at a village wide scale, the houses being close together, they would all burn um, one on top and then another and so on, so that the fire was able to spread. Another explanation for the accidental fires was that more materials were probably being stored inside the houses, like grain or textiles. And the other, another explanation for this also was that they had in ovens internally in the, in the houses at this time. Another very favorite explanation was that the, the, uh, for these is that they were deliberate deliberately started, that the fires were deliberately started by raiding parties on, in local or inter-regional conflicts. The houses themselves are very solid structures. They're built of what's called wattle and daub. That means that there's a wood framework between the wood, wood, the wood posts is woven these sort of branches in a, what's called wattling and uh, underneath the floors themselves, there's often an, a foundation of wood. And on top of the floors is a thick layer of clay, which gives a, the house a nice warm foundation. And the walls themselves are covered both on the outside and the inside surfaces by thick layers of clay. So this is a house from one of the houses from the Ukraine. This one is from Serbia. And it's the same kind of, say, exactly the same kind of structure. And you can see in this image that the clay for the walls is dug from um, alongside the houses. And then the pit that results from that is uh, used, is filled up with trash. And um, it's a very clever way of dealing with your trash. You bury it. And um, so that's under normal circumstances, that is, without burning, these kind of houses, as you can see from this experimental one that was uh, built in by some archaeologists in France, the house would just rot. The, uh, uh, with, if it's not maintained, this whole clay will just rot, the whole thing will fall back into the earth. And as archaeologists, we probably wouldn't find it at all. So, in a way, it's this, the, burnt house, the burning of the houses is very fortunate for us. Mirjana Stevanovic and I, you can see Mirjana here on the left, uh, started a project to actually investigate this burnt house horizon and to understand or to really test and investigate 
whether the oops whether the houses were actually accidental or were they deliberate events, deliberately burn, uh, fired of, uh, houses, were they a single event, that is, was each house burned as a single event, or were they burned as village-wide events? Because this had never actually been tested. And again, was, did it, could we tell whether this was happening at the beginning, at the, as part of the construction of the house, or uh, as part of the end of its use life, life history. Even without any kind of um, investigation, we actually knew quite a lot about the houses. We knew, for example, that they were burned from anything from a low oxidizing fire um, at about 600 to 800 degrees centigrade, that's not exactly low, in terms of your cooking, it's at like 1200 to 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's enough to fire ceramics of um, cooking pots. But the houses were burned from about that sort of low temperature up to what you see here, which is very high, a high temperature fire in a reducing atmosphere of about 1000 to 1200 degrees centigrade. That's getting on from to 2000 to 1200 degrees, uh, 2100 rather, degrees Fahrenheit or higher, which will turn clay into glass and turns this clay, this building clay daub, into a glass-like uh, structure. It's vitrif what's called vitrified. And it's enough to actually melt copper and it will turn something like this piece of uh, linen uh, which when I found it many years ago was the earliest piece of linen we had ever found in, um, in Europe. It's not anymore. The, the record has been broken, like many records get broken. But this was really interesting. It was found between two, two layers, two floors, between the roof and an upper layer and the, um, the actual ground floor of the house. And it was, it's survived because it's been turned basically into a glass. Its fibers have been vitrified. So it's actually very difficult to replicate these fires and to burn down a clay-based structure to look like what we find archaeologically. Many people have tried, and you see a couple of experiments here, this one in the Ukraine, this one in Serbia, and they've, nobody has yet succeeded in burning the, burning the houses and leave um, with the same kind of temperatures that we have found um, in the archaeological sites. The highest they've been able to do is up to 700 degrees centigrade. Remember that the, uh, the fires that we were investigating have been burned at least to 1,000 degrees centigrade. So we also knew that the fires were, were well contained and the burning was carefully guided for the walls to collapse inwards so that around, around the fires there's actually an open space of unburned soil, which is very indicative of, of carefully controlled fire not of accidental fire. So it would need a lot of fuel, a lot of time, they had no accelerants, and a, a great deal of skilled know-how in order to be able to burn, to, to burn one, these houses down. And as far as we can tell, during this 1,000 to 1,500 year period, every house in, uh, in that area of Southeast Europe was burned in this way. Of course, there is the problem that if it was unburned, we wouldn't find it. But there, we don't see significant gaps in the, in the settlements. So just something um, to, to remind you that at this period, these, the residents of those houses were masters and mistresses of pyrotechnology. They knew how to control and to manipulate fire. They also they, uh, and to create 
um, copper artifacts by melting the copper to these 2,000 degrees, the required 2,000 degree Fahrenheit, and to control a fire, an oven in reduced circumstances without oxidizing these very beautiful uh, ceramics that are characteristic of the period um, in all of the different areas. One other thing that we knew was that there were no human remains found within the remains of the houses. We found some animal bones, but no articulated animals were found in the fires. So I'm just sort of setting up the mystery for you here. So what we did then was an archaeological arson investigation. And um, here you can see uh, Miriana is big, is the, this is one step of the, of the analysis that she was doing, which was not only to map the actual um, impressions of the wood framework, but also to actually measure the temperatures at which the, uh, the rubble was fired or burned in over the different areas of a house. So the reason for this is that uh, in any arson investigation, you want to identify hot spots, you have to make a fire map, which is what she did, we did together actually. So this house, for example, is this one here, and the coloured spots, the blue, the green, and the yellow, are measuring areas of vitrification, that is really high temperature uh, firing. And from this, she, uh, she concluded that there were two hot spots in this, in this particular house. And as any arson investigator will tell you, if there are two hot spots, you should be very suspicious. So this was how uh, Mira uh, reconstructed the path or the, the process of the fire in that house. So we got the house here without any fire here. The two hot spots are the two uh, fire centers of origin of the fire directly below the main, what would have been the main roof um, beam. And so the roof beam is encouraged to collapse and then the, the walls will collapse on top, of, on top of that. And here you can see the whole thing neatly all doing what it's supposed to be doing. So what we... Our results showed fairly un unambiguously, which is a nice, uh, quite a rare phenomenon in archaeology, that at least in the sites that we excavated and investigated, the fires were separate events and they were started and carried out entirely deliberately, intentionally. So there are various uh, explanations for that can be then, or can then be um, proposed, and that's where the ambiguity comes, because any, not any, but some of, the, some of these explanations could be more plausible than others. So one of the least plausible is that every single fire was the result of a single event of aggression. We don't think that there were that many aggressive neighbours setting fire to their neighbours' houses at that time, but it has been proposed. A second explanation is weatherproofing. This was um, proposed by some of the, uh, one of the Ukrainian archaeologists on the basis of the lovely floors that are created when this house was, um, was built, and that the idea was that the fire would cement this into a really weatherproof um, floor and a weatherproof walls. The fact that the whole house <coughs> collapsed and burned at, after the weather, weatherproofing made this one, this explanation, less plausible. The, what's that you've got down there? Two minutes, I'm almost <laughs> done. What have you got? I got a two, but hers is better. I thought I'd go with fire color. <laughs> you didn't get anything. I let you talk on, That's see? That's why you go first. <laughs> so, he knows that I'm almost done anyway. 
because we had to do this whole talk before on Tuesday, if you didn't realize. Um, so purification and fumigation is a well-known explanation for those of you who know about Navajo Hogan burning. And um, it's possible that this might be an explanation that we could ad adapt to the, to the house burning in Southeast Europe, the Neolithic house burning. Um, there's a, so that's a, something to bear in mind. We can't actually prove one way or another. There is a model, another explanation, which is probably not at all appropriate for the Neolithic, but it certainly is something that we thought of um, some of the big fires, of urban fires that have happened in the history of Europe um, can be thought about. And one of these is the big f uh, Great Fire of London in 1666, which um, may have been for, to fumigate on, and purify the whole city. It certainly could have been accidental, that's true, but it also could, it did certainly help to fumigate after the Great Plague the year before, and it also resulted in a very nice rebuilding program throughout Europe. The same with Nero's fire as well, but we don't think, I just put that in for fun, really. Our favourite um, explanation is that this was a kind of funeral pyre for the household. And this is one that, uh, an idea that it was a ritual performance to mark the end of a house or household in social memory, coinciding with the death of a significant person who is not burned or buried inside the house. So these are the, the kinds of um, lessons that we've learned from this, this whole exercise, uh, one is that um, one of the conditions around which, uh, an important condition around which this burned house horizon um, happens is the importance of household organization as the primary socioeconomic unit. This again is not proven, but it's, an, it's one of those little cards that we build archaeology from and one card we're hoping that that card is pretty solid but it could all fall down it's true so uh, another archaeologist John Chapman has argued for the symbolic burial of fragmented things in that we see on the floor of the house as it being as important as the burning of the house itself he thinks that the objects might represent a sort of mortuary set laid out as an idealized rep representation of the household to express regeneration and continuity. Continuity and remembering is definitely an important aspect of this house burning. That's certainly there. And one of the things that we, we've seen is that the burning of the house acts as a memorial thing on the not just for the following generation, but for thousands and thousands of years. It's still something that we see on the landscape as a result of, of their actions. I mean, you could ask why burn a house for this purpose, and that would be one of them. It, the mess that it leaves is what's important, but it's also something that Tim referred to it's also the process, the act, the performance of the fire is a very dramatic, a dramatic event that can last in the memory, the social memory of the community, definitely of the individual, for many, many years <coughs> in terms of stories and so on. The emotions and passions are invented, invested in a house and this all will have an effect when the whole thing is burned like a funeral pyre. So I, finally, I coined this term domithanasia, from like euthanasia of the house. It's, it's the voluntary killing of a house by the residents or their friends or agents because it's the time to, for it to go. And it's a, it's, this is 
I leave you with the fact that this is just one interpretation. It's not the truth. It's, it's the interpretation that is our favourite and we see as the most plausible for these very reasons. And, and the fact that the other explanations are not as good. But. <laughs> Oh, thank you, John. You're welcome, Dr. Lightfoot. Hey, well, I appreciate everyone coming out tonight. I hear there's a, a great band in the Greek theater, and uh, you guys came over here, and uh, we're most appreciative of that. So I want to thank Tim and uh, Ruth for uh, outstanding talks uh, and talking about people on fire really at more of a localized scale, and uh, at the house, the village, at the hearth, in a cave. But what about fire at the landscape scale? This fire at the la landscape scale, this unrestrained fires, it's what many of us fear today, as John talked about in his introduction. You know, across the state, many of us, many of our families have been affected by wildfires. And it's caused deaths, destruction. It's blackened thousands of hectares of, of land. So thinking about this fire on the landscape scale, what does archaeology tell us about people and fire at this broader scale? And what the discipline of archaeology tells us is that people in different times and places across the globe, they learn to live with fire at the landscape scale. And they used it to actually benefit their lives. And they initiated what we call anthropogenic fires. And what I mean by this, these are fires created by people at this broad scale for a plethora of reasons, which I'll talk about tonight. So tonight, what I want to do is focus on California, the state that we live and love, and talk a little bit about native Californians and how they used fire. And I want to begin by noting as Tim and Ruth have talked about, that there's a long history of anthropogenic burning here in the Golden State. And we can really begin with some of our models of the peopling of the Americas to think a little bit about this. And the models have changed drastically since I've been in the field of archaeology, and I've only been in just a couple years, as you can see. <laughs> But uh, initially, of course, the idea was people came over Beringia, the big game hunters following the uh, megafauna. And people who came over in this way definitely were using fire. And they used fire for hunting, in this case, the bison antiquus, to chase them over cliffs or into canyons where they would hunt them and then uh, butcher them and uh, consume and use the goods. But there's also people who came down along the coast of the Pacific. And this is a relatively new idea, that people had boats. These were maritime hunter-gatherers. And California is at the forefront of this research. And <clears throat> this is a question I always ask, and some of the uh, students from various classes are here. You know, where are our earliest archaeological sites in California? And where do you think they are? Well, they are underwater, but the ones that we have actually studied and are well dated are the Channel Islands. And the earliest sites go back around 13 to 14,000 years ago. Of course, if you talk to native scholars, they'll talk about as if, you know, they have been here forever. But I'm talking about sites that have been well dated, radiocarbon dated. Earliest sites, like the Arlington Springs, down here on Santa Rosa Island, you know, dating back about this time, they found lots of charcoal. And the charcoal is associated with a broad scale fires. And there's a number of different interpretations. One interpretation is it was climate change. These were natural fires at the end of the Pleistocene. 
Another one, which they're debating right now in the literature, where was a major comet hit the Earth 13,000 years ago and created firestorms across Western North America. What I think was going on is people were bringing the fires with them. These are anthropogenic fires. Now, from this beginning, fire has become or became a critical management tool at the landscape scale here in California. And there's now been considerable research on this. And this research is collaborative and interdisciplinary. Collaborative because it involves tribal scholars, archaeologists, anthropologists, ecologists, and others. It's interdisciplinary because it brings together a number of the different disciplines, as well as resource agencies like California State Parks and the National Park Service. And in these studies, we employ multiple lines of evidence. One line is working with the tribes and tribal histories and tribal memories about fire. And here you can see Val Lopez and other members of the Amamutsan Tribal Band who we work closely with. There's also ethnographic, actually ethno-history work, gosh, <coughs> ethno-history, early explorers work. And this was done by one of our key uh, members of our research team, Dr. Rob Cuthrow. And what he did is we went back and looked at some of the Spanish accounts. For example, the Portola Expedition, 1769. They talk about native fires and burning. And what Rob did in a really amazing piece of research was the stippled areas are all the areas here around the San Francisco Bay where they actually saw in 1769 burning. So we have this kind of evidence as well from these early explorers, early settler accounts. And then there's ethnographic accounts from some of our early ethnographers beginning in 1901. UC Berkeley being the centerpiece of ethnographic research when the department and museum were founded in 1901. And we learned much about fire from these resources. And there's also ecology, which we bring in. Fire scars, this is how a lot of the fire histories here in California are produced. Sequoias up in the Sierra Nevadas, Coast Redwood down here on the coast, looking at fire scars and being able to date those and getting an idea of the, the number of fires and when they happened. There's also pollen, charcoal, and other kinds of evidence from coring wetlands, which we've been involved with. And this gives you an idea about changes in the vegetation, changes in charcoal accumulation, which can be a result of fires. And again, working out these uh, changes using good radiocarbon dating. And of course, there's archaeology. Mark Hilcom here down at State Parks with one of our recent uh, Trinity Miller one of our recent graduates here from the anthropology department. Uh, and through the archaeology, and here we're working with the Yama Mutson and some of their, uh, basically, uh, their uh, stewardship core, some of their native peoples who are uh, working with us, uh, excavating here. And what these excavations have provided us is with artifacts, but also through really detailed analysis, we can extract plants and animal remains. And it gives us an idea, along with the other lines of evidence, about what's going on with people and what they are actually harvesting, and getting a sense of that in terms of their use of anthropogenic burning. And for example, Rob Cuthrow, some of his work, we've been noting there's lots of hazelnut in some of the areas down on the Santa Cruz coast from some of these sites that date back uh, several centuries. Yet today we find very little hazelnut in some of these areas. So there's some really significant changes that have uh, taken place. So what's the take home points from this research? There's three points that I'd like to discuss. You know, why did people burn at the landscape scale? Many reasons. They would clear undergrowth, they would remove detritus. They'd control insects when there are infestations. It would facilitate game hunting, which goes back, of course, thousands of years. They even hunted grasshoppers and crickets. When they would swarm, they would burn areas, and then they would actually eat them. And then it would encourage plants to produce young, straight stems for cordage and baskets. And there was fires that were done specifically for this. 
But most importantly, fire was initiated to augment the productivity of economic plants and animals in their territories. And this brings up the second point, is how did they burn at the landscape scale? And the idea is, is that they instigated fire regimes characterized by frequent, small, low severity surface burns. And they would burn small patches in their territories. And they would create this patchy mosaic of vegetation stands. Question is, is how did they constrain fire? And as one of the elders said, they were, we, we would burn early and burn light. And they would use landscape features like streams, ridges, rock outcrops, and also past fires to constrain where they would move fires in terms of this light fire methodology. And the strate strategic use of light fires greatly increased local biodiversity because you'd have these different stages of succession. Grasslands, tubers, when you first burn, you allow them to stay for a couple years and you begin to get scrubland with berries and then woodlands might come in. And so you can envision a territory where they're rotating fires across it and selecting out what kind of food resources, medicines, and other kinds of plants and animals that they wanted to attract in their territories. So the third point is the outcomes. So what's the outcome of this kind of light burning? Well, one, it increased the quantity, diversity, and sustainability of the plants and animals used by people. And these were the plants and animals they depended on for food, medicine, and various raw materials like baskets, making houses, etc. And the regular burning of fire at this landscape scale in a patchwork mosaic it's argued to reduce fuel loads and create fuel breaks after recent burns. And as Kat Anderson, one of our great scholars, has argued, it minimized the risk of catastrophic fires. And Native Californians learned to live with fire for many centuries. And it's something that we have yet to learn here in contemporary California. So the ultimate goal of our research program, which is ongoing, is how lessons from the past may be applicable to contemporary California. And here at UC Berkeley, we are working closely with the Yama Mutsun Tribal Band, who are involved in tribal revitalization efforts. The tribe is committed to enhancing the health and vigor of indigenous plants and animals in their traditional territory. And these are the kinds of resources they want to exploit today for food, medicine, and raw materials. We're also working with resource agencies such as California State Parks and the National Park Service. They have a keen interest in indigenous landscape management practices because these landscape management practices might enhance the diversity, productivity, and sustainability of native species that they definitely want to bring back on public lands. And it can also possibly minimize the risk of major fires on, in public lands. So what we are exploring right now is how indigenous landscape management practices may be integrated with modern range and forest practices to generate new policies aimed at improving the management of open spaces in California. There are challenges to this. And there are four challenges that I'll mention right now. The first is that we are not trying to reconstruct a pre-colonial world. Sometimes when I talk to people, they think we're trying to reconstruct Jurassic Park. It's not what we're doing. We live in a very, very different world than Native peoples did centuries ago. And it is very different. We have an expanding urban wildland interface, people building out into our uh, wildlands. 
We've, of course, had this invasion of foreign plants and animals, and these have to be managed as well. And these kinds of, of intrusive plants and animals were never here when native peoples developed their initial landscape management practices. So this is all new. And we also have rooms full of lawyers who love Berkeley archaeologists who are attempting to go out on a limb here. So that's the first one, is this whole issue that we're not trying to reconstruct the past. The second is, is climate change, that we have global warming that's taking place. And global warming can create a very difficult situation for fires and can make the frequency and the severity of fires increase. The third challenge is a recognition that we may not be able to do prescribed burning in all places. There are all sorts of issues, especially if you're near urban settlements. There's liability issues. There's regulations, including pollution, air quality, endangered species. And there's health issues with smoke. So the idea that you're going to be able to prescribe burn everywhere across California, well, it's not going to happen. So what we need to do is employ other options as well, mechanize or manual methods of fuel reduction and thinning out areas. And the fourth challenge is we need to initiate long-term maintenance of places. You, you can't do this one time and say it's done. You have to repeatedly do it, because otherwise everything comes back. So it's a long-term commitment that you have to be involved with. So where are we at this time as I wrap up? Our partners, <coughs> working with UC Berkeley, the Alma Mutsen Tribe, the Alma Mutsen Land Trust, California State Parks, and others, were experimenting with the opening up of some areas of the landscape uh, in, on public lands. And in some cases, we're using prescribed fires or we're using other methods to open up these areas. And the boots on our ground are essentially the stewardship core of young members of the tribe, students, and volunteers. And we are exploring how we can revitalize landscapes and facilitate the growth of existing native plants and also bringing some of the, attracting some of the animals and in some cases, we're reintroducing species that we know, based on the archaeology, were once very plentiful there. And so we believe that we can construct open spaces. And if these are strategically designed and placed, working with our partners in the resource agencies like State Parks, National Park Service, they can address three crucial concerns today. And these are the final points I'll make. First, they can enhance the quantity and diversity of indigenous plants and animals, which I think we're all behind and want to see. The second uh, development that can take place is it can provide better food security for tribal members, because it'll provide places for tribal harvesting of native foods, medicines, dance regalia, plants for making baskets. And this is one of the complaints of many tribes is they don't have access to these various resources. And we're working with Jennifer Sauerwine and Tom Carlson, two professors here who work closely with the Kuruk and Yurok native peoples who have very similar kind of program in terms of food security. And there's much that we're learning from them. And that's a fellow UC Berkeley project up in the northwest part of the state. And then finally, we feel that in developing this kind of methodology, we can create extensive fuel breaks in critical areas on public lands that can help minimize the risk of major fires. And those are really the three outcomes that we want to see. So I appreciate greatly uh, your attention. Thank you very much. So I am from the Lassen National Forest. I'm the forest archaeologist. So you've heard about how people used fire in the past and how it's shaped our um, cultures. Well, I'm going to talk about how we as archaeologists 
for the land management agencies are trying to protect the archaeological um, record that's out there during all these wildfires that we're having today. So when we have an ignition, any kind of ignition, a lightning strike or a human-caused fire, um, and it starts running across the landscape, there are a bunch of us that are, are fire archaeologists. We are trained as firefighters. We have what we, they call a red card. We've gone through all the same training that firefighters do. We have various amounts of experience. I got my first red card 20 years ago. So I've been doing this for a while. So when there's a fire, it starts, it starts getting bigger. Um, and the bulldozers start running to try to put the fire out. And the firefighters start working along that fire line. We fire archaeologists will turn in our um, Indiana Jones fedora for a hard hat, a fire shelter, and some big heavy fire boots. We'll get out there. And we're going to try to protect what we can. We can't protect everything. This is an example of a, a railroad trestle that was made out of giant sequoia logs. So it used to be about six feet tall. And this is a series of pictures that uh, over two days. So it, we tried to protect it, but an ember got into it. So this was day one. This was day three. So all that was left were the impressions of where the logs were. And so we all know that wood burns really easily, um, but for other things that you don't think of that are affected in the archaeological record from fire are um, obsidian, chert, rocks. Uh, you break a piece, it shatters with the different heats and uh, fast cooling. You lose a part of it. You lose abilities to date it based on its shape. You lose colors, so you lose where the source was. And then sometimes you completely lose that it was even a piece of obsidian. So this was just heated for at about 14,000 degrees for 30 minutes, and it turned into a, a, not even obsidian anymore. It's a pumice. And in California, one of the major things that we use on archaeological sites for dating those sites is obsidian hydration. Most of our sites are lithic scatters, obsidian lithic scatters. And when it's flaked, you get this obsidian hydration band, which you can measure, measure it in microns. But that measurement, put through a big mathematical formula, gives you a date of when it was last flaked. So when it's burned, you actually can't measure it anymore. You lose that ability to date that flake, that artifact. And so you, you no longer can date that site. Other things you wouldn't think would be affected by fire, groundstone. So um, a mono and a matate, it, the surface burns. We often, when they're pounding acorns or whatever their protein they're pounding, that residue will do a protein residue analysis. But if it's burned off, we will we'll never know what they used, what they processed. Um, with those rocks. And other things, big bedrock mortars, so pounding acorns and other substances, fire comes through, the whole rock flakes off. So this is one example. So there, this log um, fell before the fire, and then when the fire came through, it heated up, flaked all this off. Luckily, it was not right on top of the bedrock mortar. Otherwise, we may not have known that bedrock mortar was ever there. Rock art, um, as it starts to spall off, it's gone forever. So as an archaeologist, if I have a fire that starts on, my, uh, on the Lassen National Forest, and we start working with firefighters, um, when a big fire starts, we call in these things we call incident management teams. They're between 50 and 70 people, and they're sort of in charge of putting the fire out and, and where people go and what techniques are used to put it out and support all the firefighters. So I work with those teams. I drink a lot of coffee and uh, talk to anybody who will listen to me about where sites are. They set up these things that are fire camps. Let's see. I don't think I want to upgrade. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Maybe. 
Maybe I have to upgrade. I'll, I'll upgrade to a bigger camp. Um, so these camps, these fire camps, really are like many cities. They have uh, your camping area, so you have your hotel. You have a main street. You have a hospital. You have a uh, restaurant. You have sometimes you have airports. You have everything right there. Everything that a firefighter could need. You have laundry. Um, and sometimes they last for quite a long time, and they can be quite huge. I had one that came into a town. The town was only normally 800 people. When the camp moved in, it was population 4,000. So you get a lot of people showing up, and they can last a long time. So this one fire, the rough fire in 2015 on the Sequoia National Forest, so it was 100,000 acres, which is about half of what the Mendocino complex was this year. And the car fire was about 200,000 um, acres. It lasted, I ended up working on it for 80 days. And it, it's not just like eight hour days, it's 16 hour days, 14 days in a row, two days off, 14 days in a row, two days off. To say the least, I was a little tired after 80 days. So when these things start and the, the teams are there, they hand us maps where the fire is, where they plan to do things, and we just start marking the maps up. We try to figure out what's going to be impacted. We take our maps, we go out on the fire line, um, work with the firefighters. We end up, we, here's our fire shelter, so hopefully uh, if the fire's gonna get too close to me, I might have to use the fire shelter. I never have had to use one, and uh, I hope never to. Um, but we take our maps, we go out there, and we flag sites. You see this little pink flagging? That's telling the firefighters there's something to pay attention to, and we try to talk to them about how to protect that site or how not to damage it with their um, fire suppression. So we get bulldozers coming in. Uh, this, it's hard to tell, these are railroad ties. This dozer is in a depression. This depression is part of a railroad logging system right outside of Yosemite. Um, it is a, a hoist system, so the logs used to be uh, pulled up and down this. There's a logging camp right up here. So we asked the, the uh, bulldozers to lift their blade and walk per perpendicular and then start putting their blade down at, once they were outside the archaeological site. So we reduced the impacts and then we had hand crews, firefighters come in and put a fire line in. Um, where the dozer would have done it. So we decreased the impact to the site um, and protected that site. Another example, so this is another giant sequoia um, railroad trestle. These are six foot tall each, so a total thing is about 12 feet tall. Uh, it's a one of a kind. Uh, it's in the Sequoia National Forest, the giant Sequoia National Monument. It is the only place in the world that they did large scale sequoia logging. So this is one of a kind. It's about a tenth of a mile, a quarter of a mile from that picture I showed earlier with those burned out, the burned out trestle. We protected this by getting 60 firefighters to take fire shelter material and wrap it up. Uh, we ended up calling it the burrito because <laughs> when you flew over in a helicopter, it looked like a huge burrito on the ground. <coughs> we also had the baked potato on this fire. But, so so um, we also can ask them to put foam and uh, water. Uh, this one, they foam this tree to protect this uh, tree because this sign has a little hand on it and it points and it says gas. And there was a gas station. I'm standing on a road down here, and there's a gas was an old gas station on the other side of the road. So, ask them to put sprinkler systems up, uh, water. So this was my very first fire 20 years ago. I, the firefighters, knew the archaeologist was coming. Um, they knew about this site, and they had already wet it down before I even got there. They, I walked up, and they're like, "Hey, we protected this site for you," and I was like, "Great! I don't have to do anything." All my, pre my presence just makes them do work. <laughs> but in a wildfire, when things are going hot and heavy and you, the winds come up, things change. And we're working with the firefighters as those things rapidly change. So in this situation, the fire came over the fire line that they had put in. 
had to ch totally change tactics. We actually came down uh, what we call an escape route to a safety zone. And this is a safety zone in the middle of a campground. And then they started pulling out the maps and saying, where can we go next? Where can we start um, putting in suppression lines and control lines? And where can we stop this fire? So I'm standing on top of a big um, garbage can because I'm too short. All these firefighters are taller than I am, and this truck was taller than I am. So I stood up on top so I could look at the map while they're talking. And they're like, OK, we're going to put dozer line in here, and we're going to do this here. And I went, I went hey, hey. Over here, there's a cabin. Can we get that cabin wrapped? I'm like, OK, sure, Lynn. We'll do that. So they, uh, we start doing that. We also can start calling in other archaeologists to come and help while they're um, putting in more dozer lines. But sometimes it's not safe for us to be out there. So um, this is the lights of a bulldozer. And I don't really want to walk in front of a bulldozer in the middle of the night. I uh, really don't want to be squished. So. They will uh, let them do their work, tell them where the sites are, where they're planning on going, and make them aware of it, and tell them whether I flagged them or not. And then we'll come in afterwards. And sometimes, what you don't see when people, are, these big suppression fires, you get sometimes hundreds of miles of dozer lines. So this is on the Sobranes fire um, outside of Salinas a couple of years ago. They put in 150 miles of dozer lines. It's a lot. It's needed to suppress. Um, and we can survey that after the fact when uh, it's safe for us to do it, because you never know what you're going to find. So this is a bedrock mortar they found in the dozer line. The site was not known before the dozer line went through. So I consider it an archaeological sam sampling method. Because <laughs> you can't always see sites, right? You just do a pedestrian survey. You can't see through the duff. Well, dozers push duff away quite nicely. So you find things that you didn't expect. And the firefighters help you find stuff. So this is a, um, the dump from a, a mill site, a mean mill site. And the firefighters pulled out all the really nice bottles for us. So we could date the site really quickly. Um, we did ask them not to do that anymore. <laughs> so, so after the fire, the one nice thing about fire is that you can see a lot afterwards. You may have that damage to the sites, to the surface, but you can see a lot of stuff. You can see through the trees now. Um, and you never know what you're going to find. So this was a place called the Walker Cabin site. And this, uh, this uh, rifle, little 22 rifle, was uh, found after the fire burned through. So, but when we can see things more, so can other people. So especially along roadways, we do get increased looting after fire. Um, sometimes they like to drink their beer while looting. And then this example is this little discard pile. So what you get is looters that'll go out to sites, they'll grab handfuls of things, they'll come back to the roof of their truck, and they'll go start sorting them. And they'll go, well, I want to keep that. I don't want that. I am going to keep that. I don't want that. And you end up with these little piles right on the road, right next to the site. So we try to incre increase patrols or disguise sites sometimes after fires. Additionally, so the Thomas fire in Santa Barbara and all the mudslides that occurred after that fire. Well, you think what happened to the houses? All the archaeological sites that were there too, same thing happened to them. They no longer exist where they're under uh, feet of uh, debris and mud, and so that happens here too. So this is a, um, a mining trench, um, a water system for uh, gold, the gold mining in the 1850s, and then this erosion is coming down onto sites. So we try to protect those afterwards too, under what's called BEAR, or Burn Area Emergency Response. This is just throwing um, weed-free hay on, across the site. Just decreases runoff, um, just limits some erosion. You can try some other techniques. So archaeologists, we love stratigraphy, right? If things change um, stratigraphically, we lose context. We lose uh, what was happening uh, first or last. And so this is a root wad that burned out. So the whole root of the tree burned out into the site. And we said, if that collapses, we're going to lose all the stratigraphy that is left on the site. So we took some filter fabric, um, 
some soil from off the site, brought it in, uh, cleaned it up, threw some hay on top, and you never would have known there was a root wad there. Put it on the site map so the archaeologists know that you did it, and uh, you just protected some of the site. And other things like these uh, straw wattles to deflect water away from the site. So the site is down here. So these wattles are just trying to keep the water from going directly down into the site, but push it off to the side and have most of the erosion take place outside of the site boundaries. Uh, silt fencing and other things will do the same thing. And then we try to clean up a little bit ah, if we have sites that were bulldozed or had suppression actions take place in them. So we might screen the, um, and see what artifacts came up in the berm or do shovel tests or anything else for determinations of eligibility under the National Register. So that's sort of what we do to try to protect and minimize impacts to cultural resources during wildfires. And if you want more information, it's uh, firearchaeology.com and the Facebook page. Just a comment, if I may, uh, I think all of the pre presenters did an outstanding job in their respective subjects. I was very impressed. In particular, I liked the last two, not to take away from the first two, but I retired from the U.S. Forest Service 38 years. I've been retired for 28, fairly knowledgeable about fire management. And I think uh, the young lady who talked about archaeology and uh, talked about the history of the use of fire by Indians did a superb job they offered great insights and I think for, for me with my background this has been a great experience and I thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>
is is the Forest Service using control burning to protect archaeological sites? Yes, we do sometimes. Um, more in the context of larger prescribed burns that that protects the sites that are in those prescribed burns. But we are sometimes figuring out which sites that we want to do. We also do mechanical thinning, um, either mastication or hand thinning on sites to reduce those fuels too. Right. Right there. Uh, let's go Professor uh, how do invasive species affect the uh, efficacy of native uh, biotech practices? Well, uh, the problem with invasive species is that if you do prescribed burning, which was uh, used for centuries here in California, and certainly uh, worked with many of the indigenous plants, um, the problem with some of these intrusive species, some of the uh, grasses, Scotch broom and others, they come right in. And they'll, and they'll basically uh, come in and they'll actually over, they'll crowd out indigenous uh, plants. So the, so the issue is, and this is something Rob Cutthroat has been thinking a lot about, is just how do we manage these spaces with these intrusive plants that are oftentimes coming quicker than the indigenous. And I think one of the ways is sometimes just to go out and actually remove like, some of these plants, Scott Boom and others, and, and basically eradicate them. But this is very, very labor intensive and very, very uh, difficult. So we're kind of think, thinking about those issues and uh, trying to see what can be done economically. And my own feeling is, is that uh, I think there's a real role to have tribes involved in the management of public lands. But it's not, I can't see it, it's not gonna happen everywhere. I think it, the solutions that need to be done in terms of our wildlands, that it needs to be localized. You need to bring local people involved in it. And you gotta really think about these issues because they're, 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 they're tough. So yeah, the, the, the problem with the intrusive, you know, and, and burning can be really, really difficult. And we're certainly grappling with that right now. Yeah, great question. Thanks. Just to follow on to that, um, I think the eucalyptus, which grow very fast, and they're basically fatwood, I and mean, it's basically kindling. Yeah, I mean, there's a whole controversy. I, I don't know all the specifics, um, but there was funding to eradicate a lot of the eucalyptus on the wildland urban interface here in the Bay Area. But there was a lot of protests about removing eucalyptus. And so it can, it can be controversial, but yeah, there eucalyptus are something that I think you have to be really, really careful about because uh, given the nature of eucalyptus, uh, they will explode, especially in certain kinds of fires. So my own feeling is, is that, I mean, as part of the, the landscape now, you're not going to eradicate it, but I think we have to be really careful where we have eucalyptus. Yeah, the exfoliation, too, just sends the embers. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. I think in the 1990s, UC instituted on their, uh, like around Wharf, Livermore, around uh, Dwight Derby. Uh, you go out there and there was goats. They were bringing in goats mm -hmm. to take care of the yeah. the, the man. Still, 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 still. So, yeah. this guy behind you. You're next. I have a question for the last speaker. So, given the consequences of climate change in terms of increased high extreme fire conditions, how does the decision made by fire archaeologists like yourself about when to apply more light tactics in protecting a site, like just wetting it, versus more extreme tactics like covering the entire site with fire shelter material? Um, it's going to actually be based on what the artifacts are versus what climate change is doing. Because uh, we're looking at what, fuel, what the fuel loads are on the site, so how much brush, how much uh, timber, how many logs are there, and then and then what is the site made of. So like fire shelter material is appropriate on those wooden structures, but it's not gonna do much on top of a, a large lithic scatter. And so, and you also have to sort of weigh this, um, fire on the landscape with light fuels that aren't big logs really doesn't go deep into the site. It, the penetration of heat subsurfacely is less than 10 centimeters. So if you have a deep site, 
you're only affecting the very top, which is already heavily impacted by bioturbation and just use on the top surface. So uh, I work with things under the context of the National uh, Historic Preservation Act and the National Register and whether it's eligible for the National Register. So usually a prescribed burn, a light prescribed burn over the site is not going to affect that. You'll still have a lot to, uh, under that you can learn from that site. But if you have heavy logs on top of that site, then you get deeper penetration of heat. So then we just went remove the logs off the site and let the, and then burn through the site. So it is a balancing act of what are the impacts versus what's gained. Because if we don't burn and we don't protect the sites, the fuel load is just going to go uh, increase and increase. And then when you have a lightning strike and a fire that you didn't plan, then you're going to lose the whole site. I'd rather lose like one percent of the site than ninety percent of the site. There's actually a whole uh, NPS Forest Service and a lot of interagencies. There's actually a whole litter on the effects of fire on archaeological sites. So if you're interested, yeah, yeah. Professor, uh, you mentioned that the, the stone circle uh, was about three hundred feet from the entrance. Yeah, those are right. stalagmites, right? Stalagmite. Yeah. Uh, was that to search, search for the complete darkness? Was that the the, the closest they could be by complete darkness? Why the distance? Uh, I don't know why the distance, why they chose that spot, but it would have been completely dark, 300 meters in. So oh, meters? Meters, 300 meters, yeah. That, that seems quite a distance. Yeah, it's a long yeah. way. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's over three football fields. So, any hypothesis about where the stalactites right there? So they did it yeah, there. Or yeah, oh, okay. right. Yeah, they're inside the cave, and that's interesting too that they would use that material, and there could have been other materials on top of that that they would have brought in. But um, yeah, use the materials that are already in a completely dark area. Let's go with you back there. That'll be five dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, as far as fire archaeology goes, I know there was a fire recently. My cabin was in the Donau fire. Yeah. I was wondering if, because there's, I know there's a lot of historic cabins up there, I was wondering if there were any fire archaeologists there to help with that fire and if you have any, like, important information. <coughs> I know that's very broad, but, like, there's just you know, There were archaeologists on that fire. I know a few of them that were, and uh, I helped get more archaeologists on that fire. Um, I don't know any specifics about what they protected during that fire, but uh, there were quite a few sites um, that were involved in uh, the, I do remember hearing and uh, I think seeing a video of some some structures that they wrapped during that fire. Thank you. This is for Dr. Gusme. Um, I'm actually trying to compile research uh, regarding temperatures reached in natural fires, my own research. Do you happen to know the mean and perhaps the extreme of these natural fires that are going through the California? And if it's related to the fuel, uh, yeah, the fuel load of the brush or woodland? Uh, so, um, first I'd say I'm not a doctor, I'm just an MA. <laughs> uh, but uh, the temperature extreme, is anywhere from just a few hundred degrees in like grass meadow, with just quick flashy fuels, and then uh, something like the car fire that produced the, um, the quote fire tornado or the fire, the huge fire world. Um, that is probably upwards of 3,000 degrees. Fahrenheit or Celsius? That would be Fahrenheit. Um, but mostly when you're getting into where the houses are burning because you're dealing with other chemicals. Uh, there, there is quite a large range of literature about the heat and uh, heat sensors, and there's um, some brand new publications that are going to be coming out soon from uh, work happening in the Jimenez Mountains in New Mexico. Uh, but I would direct you, if you want more literature, um, firearchaeology.com has tried to throw my whole brain on that, <laughs> including all, all my articles, uh, articles I've ever found on it. Um, but there's, my emails on it too, so you can get more stuff. Yeah, Dr. Gale, um, I'm curious what the million year old site is in South Africa that you alluded to yeah. with the We Stare paper quote. And also, um, given that the, the evidence at the Andercal sites is, is inconsistent for fire, is there any discernible 
pattern geographically or temporally about which sites lack it? Just starting from the last part, I heard three things there. I don't know of any real distribution there. And, you know, there's a lot of chance involved, too, in whether you find something in a site, because even though some of these sites might be in caves, some might be in the open air, but there's still geologic things happening that could take fire remains out of the site. You can have water rushing through, for example, a limestone cave. Um, and so it can change a lot. So I think there's some variation there, but uh, I, I don't know of a real geographic split that in some areas there was no fire, in some areas there was. It's more of a patchwork, as far as I know. The cave in South Africa, if I pronounce it right, is Um There's been a lot of work there and, and people going back and reanalyzing it. And it, it does seem, and the analysis of whether it is fire gets down to the microspectrography, where you take a column out of an excavation and kind of glue it together and take it to a lab and they look at it through different kinds of microscopes. And so a lot of that work has, uh, I think, been convincing to people that that was a place where there were lots of repeated fires in an area, uh, in a habitation area. And that's why that one is seen as being pretty good. If you contrast that to the, cha the, the cave in China, that was, uh, there was that picture of the drawing I had of the Homo erectus uh, Zucudian, or if you pronouncing that right, uh, from about a million, one and a half million years ago. Later researchers came back and uh, determined that what was thought to be ashes by the original excavators, actually a uh, fire ashes, actually seemed to be silt that had washed in geologically into the cave. So it's not easy when you're digging in the ground, maybe you've done a lot of this, um, to see exactly what is what. So the reanalysis uh, seemed to have made that less likely, it's not that well accepted. And I missed a question of the No, it's just those two. Okay, Thank thanks. <laughs> okay, I think that wraps it up. Unless there's any more questions. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. We, this is our second talk on the same thing. It's the Traveling Road Show. We'll be in the next Wednesday. <laughs> uh, but we really want you to get out and support off with our are <laughs> and uh, see what they do in the community here. So I want to thank everybody for coming.